Our next session is a flash talk on aviation security from the perspective of the FAA. URK and RTCA have a long-standing and productive relationship with the Federal Aviation Administration, working together to ensure that secure cybersecurity challenges in aviation are addressed comprehensively. The FAA's contribution is essential in setting global standards for aircraft system security. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this session, Philip Windast, Aircraft System Information Security Protection Lead at the FAA. Phil is responsible for coordinating the formation of cybersecurity policy, guidance, and risk management processes for aircraft systems, ensuring the safe operation of aircraft in today's digital landscape. Prior to his time at the FAA, Phil spent 10 years with the Transport and, uh, Transportation Security Administration, where he served as aviation security policy analyst and as crisis operations planner. Please join me in welcoming Philip Windust. Thank you, Anna. I appreciate that introduction. Um, good. Let's see here. Let me make sure I can move on to the next slide here. Awesome. Um, so, uh, good morning, everyone, um, uh, and good, good afternoon, wherever you might be. Might, might be. Um, I'm Phil Windust. I'm part of the Aircraft Certification Service, which is within the aviation safety line of business at uh, the Federal Aviation Administration. Um, as Anna, Anna mentioned, I'm the program lead for what we affectionately call ASIS, uh, and that's an acronym that stands for Aircraft Systems Information Security Protection, which is essentially cybersecurity policy for aircraft and aircraft systems. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here today as part of the RTCA Euro K Security Summit, and I sincerely appreciate the invitation to participate. Uh, so today I'll be speaking about aviation security at the FAA, and that will include uh, a discussion about a new cybersecurity regulation, which uh, that FAA has has recently proposed. Okay, so first off, let's go through a quick definition of the acronym I mentioned uh, just a second ago, ASIS, which again stands for Aircraft Systems Information Security Protection. This is a term that was first conceived back in 2005 when Boeing applied to FAA for certification of its new aircraft, the 787. Essentially, this term refers to the process that provides for the electronic security of the skin and in elements of an aircraft, which ultimately protects critical aircraft networks and systems from, and here's another acronym, IUEI, which is Intentional Unauthorized Electronic Interaction. Uh, and the overall ASIS focus is on protecting the connectivity elements that link internal and external aircraft systems and networks. Okay, so many of you may have heard that FAA recently published a notice of proposed rulemaking titled Equipment Systems and Network Information Security Protection. This particular rule, when it's published in final, will be inserted into several parts of Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations, um, which include Part 25 for transport aircraft, Part 33 for engines, and Part 35 for propellers. An applicant seeking certification in any of those parts will be subject to this new rule. So what will this rule actually, actually require applicants to do? Um, well, first, they will need to identify and assess any security risks that are posed by IUEI, Intentional Unauthorized Electronic Interaction, um, which is that term we just introduced a second ago. Second, for any risks that have been identified and assessed, they will need to mitigate those risks to an acceptable level, um, usually by including within the design of the aircraft system appropriate security controls and protections. And finally, applicants, which are typically manufacturers, will need to provide procedures in order to maintain those security protections. And those procedures are called instructions for continued airworthiness. And they are provided to the operators of those transport aircraft engines and propellers. Okay, so why do we need a new rule right now? Well, the primary reason is that explicit regulations that address the cybersecurity of aircraft systems do not currently exist in part 25 of the CFR. Um, or parts 33 and 35. But hold on, that doesn't mean that cybersecurity has not been addressed in, in the past. In fact, it's been addressed for almost two decades. 
So it turns out there's a provision within Title 14 um, in uh, Part 21 called Special Conditions. And these apply whenever airworthiness regulations do not contain adequate safety standards because of a novel or unusual design. So when Boeing first applied to FAA for certification of the, of the 787, FAA noticed uh, within that design that there were some connectivity elements that had not been seen before and decided that the regulations in Part 25 at that time were not sufficient to ensure appropriate protection of those connectivity elements. So FAA developed special conditions for that aircraft in 2005, and special conditions have subsequently been developed for every aircraft designed or modified with electronic connectivity since that time. A key note to highlight here is that special conditions are in fact rules, but they are rules only for a specific aircraft. So they need to be developed separately for each unique design whenever an application is made to the FAA. Okay, so what have these special conditions, uh, have, have, what have they required applicants to actually do for the last 20 years? Um, well, even though separate special conditions have needed to be developed for each unique design for the last two decades, they all say basically the same, same, same thing and have required each applicant to do basically the same thing. And that is first to show that their proposed aircraft design provides isolation from or protection against internal and external unauthorized access. Second, that their designs prevent inadvertent changes, malicious changes, and all adverse impacts to the airplane equipment systems and network networks necessary for safe operations. And finally, to establish procedures to ensure they maintain those cybersecurity protections that have been designed into the aircraft systems over the life of that aircraft. Now, at this point, you might be thinking that these requirements sound kind of familiar, and they sound kind of basically like the same things that are going to be required in the proposed rule that FAA recently published. And you would be right to think that. And so that's why I've put the word new in quotation marks on the title of this slide. Yes, uh, it's a new rule that will be newly inserted into parts 25, 33, and 35 of the CFR, but the requirement to protect aircraft and aircraft systems, engines and propellers is not at all new. And it has been in place for almost 20 years. Again, going back to the first time FAA issued special conditions for the 787. Another reason why we're introducing this new rule is because it was a primary recommendation coming out of an advisory body called the Aviation Rulemaking Advisory Committee way back in 2016. This advisory body, the ARAC, was composed of industry subject matter experts, and they recommended at that time that FAA simplify cybersecurity oversight. And rather than continue to issue special conditions for each unique design, they recommended that FAA issue a rule that standardizes the oversight and compliance of cybersecurity requirements for aircraft systems. Um, and in addition to the new rule text, the new proposed rule text that will become part of the CFR, uh, FAA has also issued a draft advisory circular, which will have more guidance on how best to comply with the rule. So to summarize one more time and bring us back full circle to where we started, the new rule will require, require applicants to, and this is much the same way as we have required uh, uh, applicants to do through special conditions since 2005, is one, identify and assess security risks posed by IUEI. Number two, mitigate those risks. And then three, include the appropriate procedures um, within, the con in, within the instructions for con continued airworthiness uh, so that operators know how to maintain the security controls and protections that have been designed into those aircraft systems for the life of, of the aircraft. Uh, those of you familiar with rulemaking certainly understand that in order, in order to help a proposed rule get through the gears of bureaucracy as efficiently as possible, it's usually best to also include other benefits to the rulemaking action that are likely to result. So for this new rule, the benefits include the standardization of FAA's criteria for addressing intentional unauthorized electronic interaction, and it codifies those special, those sorry, those spe cybersecurity requirements that have been placed into special conditions for each new design for the past two decades. In addition, because special conditions will no longer need to be generated for each new design into the future, this new rule will, will reduce the time needed to certify a new product. 
and the costs associated with the certification process as well. Because as I'm sure you can imagine, there will be far less paperwork involved when the new rule becomes final. Most importantly, this new rule maintains the current level of safety that has been provided by special conditions for almost 20 years. And it also harmonizes aircraft systems cybersecurity requirements with our close partners at EASA. And finally, no RTCA Euro K security summit would be complete without mentioning the crucial support that these standards making organizations have provided to not just FAA, but the global community in ensuring standardized and ensuring a standardized and comprehensive approach to aviation cybersecurity. Those of you familiar with rules and regulations in Title 14 of the CFR might note that most rules are not super prescriptive, and that's actually by design because we want to make sure that it, uh, it remains the responsibility of the applicant to show FAA that they have met the requirements of the rule. Uh, but since there are a myriad of ways to do that, to show compliance, applicants often, often look to us to provide additional guidance on an acceptable way to show that a rule has been met. And these acceptable means of compliance are published by FAA in an, in an advisory circular. So for this particular rule, FAA has also published a draft advisory circular that details an acceptable way to meet the requirements of the new rule. Those acceptable means of compliance are three different standards which have been developed by a joint RTCA EuroK committee called Aeronautical Systems Security. It's SC216 on the RTCA side and Working Group 72 on the EuroK side. The standards that are referenced in our draft advisory circular are RTCA DO326A, uh, Airworthiness Process Specification, RTCA DO356A, Airworthiness Security Methods and Considerations, and RTCA DO355A, Information Security Guidance for Continued Airworthiness. These are all specifically process standards that provide guidance on incorporating principles of security by design during the aircraft certification process to ensure that, that protection against to ensure protection against intentional unauthorized electronic interaction. And FAA appreciates the immense amount of work that has gone into the development of these, uh, of these industry consensus standards. And that work doesn't end. Threats and vul vulnerabilities continue to evolve, and the work of the joint RTCA Euro K committee also continues to revise these standards and also to create new standards that address information security event management, data security, and information security management systems that all aviation organizations could implement. So this concludes my remarks, and I'd like to thank RTCA and you're okay again for inviting me to speak today. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, wherever you may be. Thank you so much, Phil Windust of the FAA for that important information on the notice of proposed rulemaking, and also for giving a shout out to the RTC and EuroK technically equivalent standards in the AC. As a reminder, we have some on-demand sessions available now that will detail the ongoing work of Special Committee 216 and Working Group 72 on these important subjects as the standards evolve. If you're interested in joining, of course, you, we would welcome more members to help us progress those standards forward. Now, um, also to remind you, when these record, when uh, the event is done, all of the sessions today will be available in the events lobby and then the EuroK YouTube channel and the RTCA YouTube channel. We really appreciate the FAA giving us this talk to present the regulatory environment in the United States. <laughs>